Um, okay, so we're talking about uh, research. Um, one of the things that uh, I hope that you do, if, uh, if you have ever have to do an article critique, the reason I want you to do it the way that I want you to do it is because I want you to use critical thinking. Um, critical thinking is uh, questioning the approach to information that doesn't blindly accept conclusions. I, you know, just because it's a psychologist and their name is, you know, Sarah Kind, doesn't mean that their research is is accurate. Uh, but that's no offense to Sarah, of course. Anybody that does research, um, how, how did they do it? Uh, what was their population? You know, you need you need to be critical of of uh, uh, of the research that was done. I mean, if they're saying that uh, all American Indians are like this because they did research on the uh, Tahano Odom Reservation. Uh, is that accurate? Is, are the Tejano Odin representative of all American Indians? And the answer is probably no. Uh, so you, you shouldn't accept uh, the conclusions blindly. Uh, examine underlying assumptions that they have made. Uh, evaluate evidence. Uh, people have done psychological research where they took babies and they said, uh, the baby looked over here and that means that uh, they weren't interested in something. That's an assumption. Does, just because the baby looks away, does that mean that they're not interested? Uh, you know, maybe they, I don't know. You know, they're babies. How in the world can you, can you uh, make assumptions like that? Uh, so we need to be critical. We need to use critical thinking. Uh, belief bias is a form of faulty reasoning in which our expectations prevent us from seeing alternative explanations for our observations. One of the problems with being a scientist is this, that uh, scientists are really, really smart people. The assumption is that be, since they're so damn smart, they know everything and whatever they think is correct. Well, sometimes they're going to be correct, but sometimes they're going to be wrong. And just because they think it was the way it should be, that doesn't mean that that's the way it is. And this is known as belief bias, and even, even scientists have these problems. Uh, we may see cause and effect where there is an effect, uh, but the cause is not certain, or at least there isn't enough information to determine cause. Harley's here. This is exciting for me. Is it sunny outside? Um, you have your sunglasses on. I was so thinking. Cloudy. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Has anybody ever tasted Wonder Bread? Have you ever eaten Wonder Bread? It's in a it's in a package with balloons on it. It's got red and yellow. And, yeah. Okay, Wonder Bread. They make Wonder Bread all over the United States. There's a reason why Wonder Bread is Wonder Bread, and I'll explain it to you in just a second. Uh, pellagra is a disease, and pellagra, as you can see, causes a lot of problems. Uh, your skin sloughs off as appetizing as that looks. Um, your teeth loosen and eventually you die from pellagra. Uh, pellagra uh, uh, infestations have occurred uh, all over the United States since Europeans first got here. Maybe you guys had pellagra, we're not exactly sure. It was a com common problem throughout history and it continued uh, into the 20th century in the United States. So we, it's all over Europe, it's all over the, the uh, uh, the cities of Europe, it's all over the United States. We've had it in the 20th century. So we, but nobody knew where it came from. It was long assumed that since people living in poverty had poor hygiene, the problem was caused by a fecal-borne bacteria similar to cholera and dys dysentery. Where does cholera and dysentery come from? Uh, somebody has diarrhea, they, uh, they uh, unfortunately, they defecate into the water supply, then the bacteria from their feces uh, gets into the water supply, and now they spread dysentery and cholera. As sad as that is, don't cry. Things aren't as bad as they seem. Uh, however, Joseph Goldberger uh, noticed that the problem was more pronounced when the population ate the same non-nutritious foods. And of course, we've had problems with poverty in the United States. One of the problems we had was that uh, people would work themselves almost to death. Uh, and the, and uh, because the uh, minimum wage was so low, 
Uh, they weren't making, they were making starvation wages. They weren't paying them enough to feed the whole family. And of course, they would have large families, yada, yada, yada. Strangely enough, in the United States, it was against birth controls against the law until the 1960s. Birth control was against the law. So you had to have all the babies you, you possibly could. Or you couldn't, and abortion, of course, was against the law until the 1970s. Okay, so there's no birth control and there's no abortion. So if you got pregnant, you had the baby and you either gave it up for adoption or it went to an orphanage someplace or, or you raised it yourself. So some of these families had lots and lots and lots and lots of kids. And if they didn't die of any childhood illnesses, then the old man had to figure out a way to feed all these kids. But he got a job and it wasn't that bad a job, but the problem was they weren't paying him very much. And this was a really serious problem in cities all over the United States, Chicago, uh, Kansas City, St. Louis, San Francisco, New York, Baltimore, Boston. Uh, they were paying the immigrants really bad wages, really uh, low wages. And why did they do that? Why didn't they just pay them more money? The answer is because they wanted to make lots and lots and lots and lots of money, as long as we are making a profit. Do we care if we legalize marijuana and it makes people stupid? No, as long as we make it enough money. Why didn't the world prohibition was working? Why in the world did we stop prohibition? We weren't making any money, that's why. So we stopped prohibition to make more money. Anyway, okay, so we've got greedy people in the United States who have lots and lots and lots of money. And that's what Bernie Sanders is saying right now. And that's one of the reasons why he is surging in the polls because he says we have the top 1% of, of the people in the United States make 80% of all the money in the United States. And he's right. We have all these billionaires. Uh, Donald Trump is one of them. Uh, Steyer, Tom Steyer is another one. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg, Mike Bloomberg, is going to try to become president of the United States. He's a, he's a billionaire. That's how he became uh, mayor of New York. Uh, Andrew Yang, another businessman, wants to become president of the United States. They're all billionaires. Uh, but along comes Joseph Goldberger. Uh, he noticed that the problem was more pronounced when the uh, population ate not very nutritious food. So you could eat, I mean, maybe you're getting enough to, to eat, but it wasn't very nutritious food. By exam uh, experimenting on prison inmates, Goldberger was able to prove that pellagra was the result of niacin uh, deficiency. Niacin is vitamin B3. <clears throat> but it took several more decades before the doctors accepted his findings because it would have meant social change in states that didn't want to take responsibility for their poor. In other words, it has to do with money again. He was right. It has to do with the vitamin B3 <laughs> deficiency. But he couldn't convince the doctors because if the doctors agreed with that, then they would then the the state where they lived, they would have to start feeding their poor. They would have to do they would have to find nutritious food for the poor people, and they didn't want to do that because poor people are the people we don't like. They are the minorities. Uh, they're the immigrants. They're the black people. They're the Hispanic people. They're the native people, and we didn't want to feed them because it would cost us too much money. After Vietnam, there was a, this huge influx of, of uh, people with PTSD, but we, the federal government would not admit that these people needed help. Why? Because then they'd have to pay for it. They didn't want to pay for it. We sprayed, we sprayed uh, the jungles of Vietnam with Agent Orange. And then it made people sick. It made the Vietnamese sick, but it made us sick as well. I mean, it made our soldiers sick. But if we had admitted that, if the federal government had admitted that they were getting sick because of what they did during the war, then they would have had to have paid for it. And they didn't want to do that. There are still people fighting for 100% disability who were, are Vietnam vets, and they're still fighting for their disability. Why won't the Veterans Administration give them the money that they deserve? Because it's too expensive, so they don't want to do it. We are cheap sons of bitches, each and every one of us, well, the federal government, anyway. I guess 
the three of us are not, but they are. Okay, so something's going on in the world right now. There's an outbreak of a virus. <clears throat> I know the coronavirus. It's so exciting. So here I am, I'm teaching this stuff, and we suddenly have an outbreak of a coronavirus. When the weekend started, we had two cases in the United States. Now we have five cases in the United States. It's more than doubled in three days in the United States. There are over 2,700 cases in China. China has 1.5 billion people. China has more than a billion people than we do. We only have 300,000 people in the United States. They have 1.5 billion people. So they have, they have not, let's see, they have how many times? Five times our population in China. We have more land mass than they do. It's kind of crowded over there. And now they're, they have a problem with coronavirus because, well, they, you know, they eat really strange foods too. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the expose about uh, what kind of foods they eat in China, but they eat a lot of wild animals that they keep in cages. And they, they think that's where the coronavirus came from, as fascinating as all that is. Okay, so how do we know how many people are, or 84 people have died in China? The Wuhan province, which is right in the middle of the country. Uh, epidemiology is uh, the scientific study of the frequency, distribution, and causes of, of a particular disease or other health outcomes in a population. So right now we're looking at the epidemiology of the coronavirus. Uh, it's in 13 different countries, and we have five cases in the United States. So if we want to control, uh, if we want to control this, then we need to understand where it came from. We need to understand how it functions, how people get it, and we need to, to stop it at its source. And that's known as epidemiology. Psychologists conduct research in two major categories, descriptive studies and experimental studies. Health psychologists add two uh, further types of research, epidemiological studies, where we're trying to figure out where something comes from. That's how we came up with schizophrenia. That's how we came up with borderline personality disorder, with, uh, with antisocial personality disorder. We did epidemiological studies. And the other thing we do is meta-analysis. So we look at all of the, let's say we're, we're uh, looking at uh, 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 video game addiction. <clears throat> So what do we do? We look at people that have done studies on video game addiction. We look at all of those studies and we put them all together. And we say, look, in Seattle, you know, Dr. Johnson uh, found this. And then in, uh, in uh, <clears throat> the Midwest, in Indiana, they found, this is what they found with video addiction. That's, that's the way. And then we would put them all together and that would be a meta-analysis. By, by putting all of these things together is known as a meta-analysis. Descriptive studies are often conducted in the field. They may include case studies, surveys, interviews, naturalistic observations. When Freud, of course, psychology was brand new, and Freud uh, was trying to describe some of the problems that the people that he uh, treated had. So what did he do? What he did was he put together case studies. He said, look, I have uh, Mary O, and Mary O, uh, she acts this way, uh, she, uh, she can't sleep at night, uh, she has, she's paralyzed from the waist down, uh, and, and I think that this is a psychological problem. And he talked about this case study. Well, she had hysterical paralysis is what she had. He described one case, and, and of course this has to do with sex, so you don't have to listen if you don't want to, but uh, <clears throat> in the Victorian era, women weren't supposed to enjoy sex. <clears throat> He had this one lady that came in who was paralyzed from the waist down. And of course, he talked about this and that and the other. Eventually, they got into her sex life. And what they discovered was she'd been a good girl for all of these years. She had, I don't know, four or five kids. But uh, at one point, uh, she moved during sex. She enjoyed it so much that she started moving. And because of that, she became paralyzed because she was so embarrassed that she did that that psychologically, she subconsciously, 
Uh, she uh, didn't want to move anymore because that meant that she was a bad girl instead of a good girl. And so she stopped moving. She, she became paralyzed in order to punish herself for you know, it's this whole subconscious thing. It's not the only case that he had. There, were, there was a lot of uh, hysterical problems that these women, that women would have because of, uh, of the sexual repression of the 19th century. Anyway, that's a case study. Uh, surveys is another thing that we do. We interview people, uh, and uh, that's another uh, type of descriptive study or naturalistic observations where we see people in a natural environment. We look at people in a natural environment. <clears throat> we'll be gone before I get over your watch. Oh, golly. <clears throat> Come on. Oh, it's gone now. <laughs> See, I told you. It'll go before I get over there. Okay. Case studies are conducted when there is a seemingly representative case, and this case is studied thoroughly over an extended length of time. And this is how, pe uh, how Freud taught people about schizophrenia. He, had a case, he did a case study of somebody with schizophrenia. He, decided, he described their symptoms. He described how they reacted to things. He described how they reacted to his treatment. And that was a case study. Uh, because the researcher is able to make a more extensive observation, uh, the conclusions can be more involved. Uh, at the beginning of an outbreak, the first case uh, or cases will be studied in depth, and that's what they did with the coronavirus. That's what we're doing in the United States with the coronavirus uh, cases that we have found so far. Uh, so far, and actually there's one in, in Phoenix. There's a case of coronavirus in Phoenix. And the person is isolated, don't worry, then I come up here and cough on everybody, uh, hopefully. <laughs> but there's one in Phoenix, there's one in Seattle, uh, there's one in Chicago, uh, where else? And it's mostly out here, out in the West, uh, but there's five cases. Uh, and so that's what we do. We, we look at the first person that has the problem, we try to figure out why this guy got sick, uh, they're all ages, by the way. There's a uh, 20-year-old, 50-year-old, 60-year-old, uh, so there's all ages. Uh, a lot of times when these uh, respiratory infections start, oh, the one in Phoenix, uh, he's got like a cold, uh, but he has been, it's been identified as the coronavirus. Uh, but he, his symptoms aren't very bad at all. So um, <clears throat> what we try to do is figure out where it comes from, why he got it, uh, how it spread, uh, normally, if it's a respiratory infection, uh, small kids get it and old people get it. Uh, but one of the things that happened here in this area, in the Four Corners area, was uh, they had a hunt hantavirus uh, outbreak in, uh, when was that? It's when my wife went to Korea, 1993. In 1993. And the problem was that it wasn't a, a, just affecting old people. and the, pe the people that were immunocompromised, the little kids and the old farts, uh, it was affecting uh, teenagers. It was affecting the strongest people uh, in the area. And for that reason, they just scared the crap out of people. Because here we have these, uh, these athletes who were dying of, of hantavirus. So it just scared everybody to death. Uh, we, we came to this area. We were living in Mississippi at the time. No, we were living in Oklahoma. And we decided we'd come out here and look at some of the ruins, you know, some of the Anasazi ruins my wife and I, before she took off for Korea. <clears throat> and we came to the Four Corners area, but they wouldn't let us go anywhere because they, they didn't want anybody catching the hantavirus. So we didn't have any place to go, which is kind of, it was, we figured something out. We didn't have, we didn't have to go <laughs> find any Anasazi ruins, but we didn't get to see what we thought we were gonna see. Surveys examined individual attitudes and beliefs Surveys are less in-depth uh, than case studies. Larger numbers can be surveyed, of course. Surveys are conducted as self-report measures. Uh, they're not necessarily accurate. They don't have to be accurate. It all depends on how you word the questions as to how accurate they are. A lot of times you will, uh, well, you, maybe you guys don't get these things, but I get surveys from the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And of course, they want me to take the survey. How do I feel about this? How do I feel about that? But they don't ask it that way. They say, <clears throat> they say things like, uh, Donald Trump is the best president in the United States. Do you agree? <laughs> uh, 
on a scale of, you know, they, they, they couch it in terms that you can't disagree with them. Um, all the progressives in the United, people find uh, progressives uh, ver, uh, very communistic. You know, how communistic do you, uh, on a scale of one to ten, how communistic are, do you find the progressives in the United States? I mean, it's really silly stuff. Uh, but the, of course, the Democrats do exactly the same thing. Another problem is the halo effect where the subject answers the survey the way that they think the investigator expects. So if you guys were taking uh, uh, a uh, survey and, the, and it was a, this real good looking fella or this real good looking person, uh, you might uh, try to impress the individual by, uh, uh, by answering all the questions the way they wanted you to, to answer them. And this is known as, as the halo effect. The other thing is, uh, maybe you want people to think you're smart, so you answer it the way that you think that they want you to, then they'll think you're smart. The reality is that they have no clue who you are. Your, your name's certainly not on there, uh, so they don't have a clue. Uh, when ninth grade and 12th grade boys were asked whether they had had sexual intercourse before the age of 13, uh, twice as many ninth grade boys reported teenage intercourse than the 18-year-old boys. So what's happening, what, what this survey told us was that 8th grade, 13-year-old 8th grade boys were having more sex than 18-year-old boys. Do you think that, how accurate do you think that was? Or were the 13-year-old boys uh, talking about fantasy sex? Is, who's more likely to have sex, an 18-year-old or a 13-year-old? Probably 18. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> this, is, this is what a 13-year-old looks like. He hasn't even gone through puberty yet, and this kid's having sex. Yeah, right. And this is, of course, an 18-year-old. And, of course, he has gone through puberty. He's got his man muscles. Oh. Yeah, but this little punk thinks that he's, he's had more sex than the 18-year-old. Than the I don't think so. Anyway, so people lie on surveys. Obviously, they lie on surveys. That's the point. Observational studies uh, detect uh, naturally occurring relations among variables. They enable prediction. Uh, no direct control over variables. They can't determine causality is, is the problem with observing things. And, of course, if we're, if we're trying to figure out... Uh, where the coronavirus came from, that we need to figure, uh, we need to determine causality. That's what was going on with the pellagra. We had this problem, and we needed to figure out where it came from. Now the assumption was, poor people have it, so they must be getting it the same way they get cholera and dysentery. It must be a fecal-born bacteria. That's what they assumed. But Goldberger came around and said, you know, <clears throat> these guys don't eat very well. They're not eating very nutritious foods. Now, the thing about vitamin B3 is, once upon a time in the United States, at the turn of the 20th century, into the 1920s, there were a lot of immigrants who came into the United States. And they just thought white bread was the best stuff in the whole wide world. Well, the reason white bread is white is because they have processed it. They bleached it. And when they do that, they take out most of the vitamins. So they were creating this bread that had no nutritious value whatsoever. And of course they were selling it relatively cheap. So they were poisoning all of these poor immigrant kids. The bread tasted great, but it didn't have any nutritional value to it. <clears throat> so then the federal government in the, 19, in the 1930s, we realized we were going to go to war in Europe probably. And we didn't think about Japan, but we knew we were going to go to war. So we, we needed to stop poisoning our population, especially our young men. So we started fortifying the flour. And now, and that's where Wonder Bread came from. That's why they called it Wonder Bread. It's a wonder. Because they started fortifying the, the uh, flour. They put vitamin B3 in it. So we stopped having people with pellagra. So that's where Wonder Bread came from. There were two things about Wonder Bread. Well, first, it came from fortified flour, so it was actually nutritious. You could put anything in there you want, actually. Put all the vitamins in there that you want, and that's what they did. They started fortifying the, the flour. The other thing was, it's the first bread that was sliced. 
So it's as good as sliced. Yeah, I know. It's a miracle. It was a miracle. Sliced bread. Anyway. In observational studies, that's, and that's why uh, I was talking about Wonder Bread before, because it has vitamin B3 in it. So it's good now? It's great stuff. Almost all the bread you get is fortified. Uh, do you, I don't think you can sell anything unless it's made with fortified flour. So if you buy Hostess Twinkies, I, I don't know if they have any flour in them or not. If, no matter what you buy, it's, it's made from fortified, fortified flour. <clears throat> In observational studies, researchers observe and record the behavior of participants. These studies can be structured and take place in a laboratory. The studies can be unstructured and take place in the natural environment. And this is known as naturalistic observation. Correlational coefficient is a statistical measure of the relationship between two variables. Uh, our value ranges from a negative one, which is a negative or an inverse correlation. So every time this happens, this does not happen. Uh, to a positive 100%, uh, 1.00 positive correlation. So every time this happens, that happens. Uh, if you step in the water, you get wet. If you go out in the snow, you get wet. Snow is always cold, water is always wet. That's 100% correlation. But if you stepped in the sand, how wet is the sand unless it drained recently, then the correlation is very poor. If we're looking for wetness and we step in the, in the desert, then the correlation would be negative one. It's negative, it's an inverse correlation, so it's never wet. Sand's never wet, unless it's at the beach. I don't know, where are you, where are you guys stepping in the sand? Uh, the strength, the R value, uh, ranges from zero, no relationship between the variable, to 1.00, one, uh, 1 perfect correlation, regardless of the signs. And that is the strength. It uh, all depends on, uh, on what, what the figure that you get. When I did my own research, uh, I was trying to find a correlation between these variables. I was looking for resilience. <clears throat> so I was uh, comparing all of my independent variables with my dependent variable. My dependent variable was resilience. I was trying to find resilience among American Indians, and of course it was up north that I did the research. Uh, I was trying to find if age made a difference in, as far as resilience was concerned. Education, does that make a difference in resilience? Um, cultural level, does that have a difference, make a difference? Uh, gender, are women more resilient than men? And what was the last one? Oh, trauma, level of trauma. Because if you look at all the resilient studies in the United States, the more trauma somebody has been through, the less resilient they are. So that's what I was looking for. And what I discovered was that the only variable that was, was, had a positive correlation with resilience was culture. The stronger your culture, the, the uh, uh, stronger your resilience. The higher, higher your resilient level. Age had nothing to do with it. Gender had nothing to do with it. Education, sadly, had nothing to do with it. That would have been nice. See, I, I, I was teaching up there, and you know, I, I would have had an impact on their resilience, but of course it didn't have anything to do with it. And oddly, trauma had a negative correlation. Now, this, that was the bizarre part. Trauma had a negative correlation. If you look at all the populations in the world that they've done resilience studies on, the more trauma they've been through, the lower their resilience level. But there have been three studies, and mine was one of them, three studies that showed that American Indians, the, the more trauma they had, the lower their resilience, or the higher their resilience level. As weird as that seems. Now, one of the studies was done here on the Navajo Reservation. The other, another study was done on the Tahano O'odham Reservation, down in, down by Tucson, or yeah, by, down by Tucson. And the other one was done by me up in the Northern Plains. Oh, I know, and you're the only population that does that, that has, that, uh, that uh, can survive trauma to the extent that your resilience is actually stronger after trauma. As weird as that is. <clears throat> Strength of a correlation is determined by how closely points are clustered on a scatter plot. 
This is the reason you do a scatter plot. A perfect correlation is one that aligns along a straight line, and as you can see, this one does align across a straight line in a straight line. <clears throat> Positive correlations on a scatter plot sweep upward from lower left to upper right in this direction. That's the way they work. Negative correlations uh, move downward from the upper left to the lower right, as you just like in this situation. This has to do with car weight and miles per gallon. The heavier the car is, the less miles per gallon that it gets. What was the other one? This is size of carrots. Oh, it has to do with diamonds. How oh, price. The more carrots it has, the higher the price. I guess that's logical. <clears throat> Uh, this has to do with um, uh, body mass index. The higher the body mass index, uh, the higher the percentage of hypertension in the, in the population. This is, they were looking at African American, they were looking at people of African descent. And if you go to Nigeria, as you can see, uh, they are skinnier. They are more slender than uh, as you get closer to the United States. Africans get fatter, <clears throat> as bizarre as that is. Uh, so as far as you, so uh, you got Nigeria. And this is uh, urban Nigeria. This is rural Nigeria. This is Jamaica, the San, Santa Lucia, which is an island in the Caribbean, Barbados, and then the United States. <clears throat> now this is a bizarre thing. They can eat the same diet in Nigeria and not have hypertension and not gain weight, but in the United States, if they eat the same, uh, if they eat the same. Uh, a diet, they get fat, and then they have hypertension. The um, variable that seems to be making the difference is uh, sedentary lifestyle. People in the United States are a lot lazier than other people around the world. Here we have to drive, we can't walk. Geez, I drive from my house. Doris, did you drive today or did you walk? I did too. Doris and I live right beside each other. <laughs> and we both drove our cars to, to work today, or to school, as stupid as that is. Often when uh, two variables are plotted on a scatter plot, the results don't form a straight line, but a curved line, and this is known as curvilinear. Uh, healthcare usage by age is curvilinear. Uh, the young and the old use healthcare more frequently than teenagers and young adults, and that's just the way it is. Uh, I, uh, I had all those inoculations when I was a kid. Uh, I got sick and the doc I'd have to go into the doctor. Uh, but as soon as I joined the military, I, you know, I'm not, I never get sick anymore. As I get, uh, get older, of course, my immune system is weakening and I go to the doctor a lot more frequently. <clears throat> so it's curvilinear. So as I was, as a, when I was a, a healthy young man, of course, I never got sick. I didn't have high blood pressure, any of the other things. I didn't have a heart attack. Experimental studies are usually conducted in the laboratory. Uh, they use statistical comparison of experimental and control groups. The experimental group is a group that you actually do the experiment on. The control group, usually you don't treat them with the same, uh, with the same uh, uh, variable. You don't treat them at all. They are your control. They are to see if there was actually a change. So you have a control group and an experimental group. I used to work with a doctor in uh, Vienna, Virginia, and he did experiments with uh, otitis media. Otitis media is where you have an infection of your middle ear. Uh, kids get this kind of stuff all the time. Usually it has to do with milk dripping into their ears a lot of times. <clears throat> but the other thing that we discovered was that American Indians are uh, have uh, otitis media more prevalently than, than any other group. And the reason is because your ear canals are, are, sh are shaped differently. Uh, your ear canal is shorter, tends to be shorter. So if moisture gets in there, it, it tends to get down to the eardrum. Uh, other populations have a longer ear canal, and because of that, and yours tends to be convoluted, a little bit more convoluted, so it's harder for you to stick it Q-tip in your ear and get all the way to your eardrum. <clears throat> but me, I can just, you know, it's like goes from here to over here. I can stick it cute. <laughs> Not really, I can't do that. But anyway, uh, you guys, so you guys have a lot of otitis media. 
uh, that was his, his research. Uh, what he was doing, he was treating them with antibiotics, uh, but one of the, sometimes, some of the times he wasn't treating them with antibiotics, he was treating them with a placebo. And they wanted to see if their antibiotic was working very well. So we had an experimental group and we had a control group, but we didn't know which was which. So we didn't know if we treated somebody or didn't treat them. But they had agreed to do this. I, I, I don't know, he gave, the, he gave the families money. It was really kind of weird. And this was, a, this was a really wealthy group of people that we were dealing with. Uh, the factor in an experiment uh, that the experimenter manipulates the variable whose effect is, is uh, being studied is the dependent variable. And what we're doing, we're using independent variables. The independent variables are the ones that we manipulate. In my case, I didn't really manipulate them, but my independent variables were age, trauma, uh, um, culture, those were my independent variables. And my dependent, dependent variable that I was measuring with all of my subjects was resilience. <clears throat> the behavior or mental process in an experiment that may change in response to manipulations of the independent variable is your dependent variable. <clears throat> so we were trying to measure, we measured resilience with all of these different independent variables. Age, gender, <clears throat> trauma level, and whatnot. Uh, assigning research participants to groups by chance uh, to minimize pre-existing differences is a random sampling. Uh, so if I took a random sampling in here, there's four of us, uh, I, would, uh, I would just select two of you, two of us. Maybe I would be one that was randomly sampled. Uh, so I look at a total population, the four of us, and I would select a select number, two. If I were dealing with uh, the entire Navajo reservation, I think there's 300,000 people on the reservation, aren't there? 300,000 people, not that many. 275? Or, I don't know. Anyway, for the 275,000 people, uh, and I needed a random sampling, I might take 30,000 people, and I would select them randomly out of uh, you know, a list of names or whatever. In the limited or difficult population, uh, a researcher might uh, make initial contact with a member of the group, and then they will would recruit other uh, known members of the group. This is how we had to do, this is known as snowball sampling. This is how we had to, to work with uh, uh, gays uh, when we were trying to figure out where uh, HIV was coming from. Uh, at the time, um, a lot of people didn't want to admit that they were gay. Uh, at the time, a lot of, uh, in some states, being gay was against the law. Uh, so these people were hiding. They were in the closet, as it were. And so the only way that we could uh, get them to be part of our study uh, was to use a snowball sampling. We found an individual that admitted that they were gay, and we said, can you bring any of your friends in? And he did. He brought his friends in. And, uh, then, and then we tried to figure out what it was about their lifestyle that made them susceptible to HIV. And, of course, what we figured... Uh, was that they were having uh, uh, sex in these bathhouses, and that's why all these people were dying out of uh, New York and San Francisco. They had bathhouses. All those bathhouses are closed now, uh, and the reason is because so many people died of uh, HIV in that area. But in order to just discover what we were trying to find out, figure out, uh, we had to use snowball sampling. A lot of people didn't want anybody to know that they were gay. Uh, it ruined their careers, you know, all kinds of stupid things. Uh, and this is back in the 1980s, and that's known as snowball sampling. Now, when I uh, did my research, I used census sampling. I used all the members of the population. that uh, I made up uh, surveys, and I sent them all out. <clears throat> because I couldn't get, um, I couldn't get uh, the uh, tribe to uh, allow me to do that, I had to use people off the reservation. So I had to use the people... Every, anyone that had a name that was uh, that was a native name, like talks difference, stiff arms, <laughs> all of these individuals have native names, and of course they're very common in that area. Uh, I had, I sent them a survey, so I s sampled everybody, everybody in two counties who had names that were were native names. Cuts the rope. I mean, how many white people have the name Cuts the Rope? 
<laughs> Not very common. And that's census sampling. <clears throat> of course, in order to do census sampling, you'd have to have a relatively small uh, population. This is 2020, and the census comes out this year. What's going to happen? They're going to count everybody in the United States. So they'll come to your house, and your house, and your house, and my house, and they'll ask me how many people live in my house. And, I will, and they will count everybody, theoretically. There are a lot of people that don't like to be counted for one reason or another. They think that uh, they're going to take their guns away, or they're going to, I don't know, lock them up or something. I don't know. But there are some people that don't want to be surveyed. But census sampling, of course, is where you, you take the entire population. Uh, Quasi-experiments, <clears throat> a study is a study in which the comparison groups differ on the variables of interest at the outset of the study. For example, active versus sedentary people, women versus men, uh, high versus low socioeconomic status, smokers versus non-smokers. And since they aren't the same, <clears throat> what, we're what we're trying to do is determine uh, what the difference is between those people. Women versus men. <clears throat> uh, we might be looking at activity level. and We're looking at, uh, are women more active than men are? Do they exercise as much? Or go to the gym? You know, that kind of a, a thing. A cross-sectional study is a study comparing representative groups of people of various ages on a particular dependent variable. Uh, that's what I did. I did a cross-sectional study. Uh, I, age was one of my factors, uh, but I couldn't wait. I couldn't do a longitudinal study. I couldn't wait for these people to grow up. I needed, I needed to uh, start experimenting with... I, I needed answers right away in order to finish my dissertation. I'd already been working on it for 10 years, so I needed to get the damn thing done before my wife shot me. <clears throat> and obviously, I'm still alive. She didn't shoot me. Um, so what I did, I compared, uh, I compared the resilience level, the educational level, and whatnot of, uh, of different age groups. So it was a cross-sectional study. Uh, the youth risk uh, behavior surveillance uh, is a cross-sectional. Remember, that's the one that the ninth graders are having more sex than the uh, seniors. Uh, it's, it's a cross-sectional study as it looks at students from four different years. Uh, results from this type of research can be considered circumspect because it assumes that differences will remain constant over time. And if you think of your high school class, when you were in high school, the seniors act one way, the juniors acted another way, the, the sophomores acted another way, and the freshmen acted another way. <clears throat> so can you really compare them as, as if they were all the same? And the answer is, well, not really. Uh, maybe uh, the seniors were listening to uh, acid rock and, or rap, and the freshmen were listening to, you know, Barney. Barney, you know, that purple dinosaur guy. Just a thought. I don't know. I don't know what they were listening. Was everybody listening to the same music? Uh, only juniors and seniors could drive because they were the only ones old enough to drive. So the freshmen and the sophomores couldn't drive. Does that make a difference? Well, of course it makes a difference. Uh, cohorts are people that have something in common uh, age. You know, all my cohorts are 70 years old. Uh, socioeconomic status, uh, we're probably middle class, maybe a little, maybe upper middle class, probably not. A uh, historical event, uh, my cohorts would be uh, people that served uh, in the military uh, during Vietnam. They would, that would be my cohort group. Uh, my dad's generation were fought in World War II. Uh, he was stationed over, or he was uh, uh, in the European theater. He went, he landed D-Day, he went all the way to Germany. So that was his historical event. My historical event was Vietnam. Um, all three of my brothers were in Vietnam as well. My little brother was there in 75 when we pulled out. But my little brother also stayed in the military and he served in Afghanistan in 2005. So he has a different historical event than I do. We all lived through the same stuff. The 9-11, we, we were all in the military. When Nixon uh, resigned, no, my older brother was out by that time. But Nixon resigned in 2003, yeah. 
No, we were all in in 2003. Anyway, that's a historical event that we were all part of. Longitudinal study uh, is a study in which a single group of people is observed over a long span of time. There's a long, famous longitudinal study uh, on the island of Maui where they're looking at individuals that when they were born they were poor. Uh, they were the poor people of Maui and what they, uh, they looked at all of these kids to find out uh, how healthy they were, how resilient they were, uh, what they did, uh, how they survived. Um, it was really interesting because we're talking about Maui and it's an island in the Sandwich Islands, in the Hawaiian Islands. <clears throat> So what would you think was the best way to uh, be able to survive in that environment? What job would you have to have that would allow you to survive in that kind of an environment? It's an island. So what, what job could did, did most of the successful people do? As it turns out, they joined the military. It was the best job for poor people from Maui to do to get off the island and to, and to be successful in life, to be more resilient in life, as weird as that is. Now there's a problem with the longitudinal studies. First of all, it takes forever. It takes a long time. I could have done a longitudinal study where I, I looked at the resilience of these 18 year old, 18 year, year olds, and every five years I measured them again to find out if their resilience had changed. I could have done that, but it would have taken too long, and I would never have finished my dissertation. Uh, it's expensive to conduct because you, you have to maintain contact with all these individuals. You have to write up, you have to do all of these surveys. You have to do all of the experiments over and over and over again in order to measure them. Uh, the results can be skewed if there's a large uh, dropout rate, which was one of the amazing things about the Maui study because a lot of people didn't drop out. Some of them died, but there weren't a lot of people that died. And for that reason, it was a fairly accurate uh, research. What time do we end? 420? 3. 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock to 420. Right? Okay. <clears throat> the basic question in developmental psychology is which is more important, nature or nurture? Is it the genes that you, uh, that you have from your parents or is it the, your, the environment that you grow up in? In order to answer this question, researchers will look at a trait and try to determine whether heritability is more important or whether it is the impact of the environment. Heritability is the amount of variation in a trait among a group of individuals that can be attributed to genes. So we're talking about heritability here. <clears throat> Why do people have blue eyes? Why is that important? Why are blue eyes important? Or are they important? What's the difference between blue and brown eyes? Blue-eyed people see better at night. Brown-eyed people see better during the day. As weird as that is. I know, it gets weird. Not that that's, I don't know how important is that. I can see okay during the day, I've got blue eyes, but I can see better than brown-eyed people at night because more light is coming in because my irises are, are blue, as weird as that is. To this end, researchers will use two techniques to measure differences. Uh, one is twin studies and the other is adoption studies. Uh, the twin studies compare identical twins with fraternal twins to see which traits are the most likely to be genetic. So the, by looking at twin studies, we've determined that Alzheimer's disease is a genetic disease. Uh, if you, if one of the twins has Alzheimer's disease, the other one has a 60 to 75 percent chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. Um, when it's a fraternal twin, the Alzheimer's disease is, uh, is only uh, 30 to 45 percent. Okay. <clears throat> adoption study, the other is that we look at adoption studies. Adoption studies, researchers are looking at how two dis disparate uh, environments affect the outcomes of identical twins. And of course we've done this and uh, they have these amazing stories of how the guys married women, both of them were, you know, these are identical twins that were separated at birth and both of them became uh, firemen and both of them married a woman named Karen and both of them grew a mustache and both of them had two kids. 
They both eat, everybody ate Wonder Bread. They look up exactly, of course they're identical twins, so of course they look identical to each other. So we looked at uh, adoption studies. Um, <clears throat> epidemiological research is when we track diseases, and this is really, really quite important. My wife, used, my wife uh, was a hospital administrator, and one of her jobs was to make sure that there weren't some strange diseases that were overtaking uh, the community. She lived in, we were living in uh, Chinook, Montana, and we were looking at all the diseases that were the problems in that, those areas. <clears throat> so what, would, what she would get every, uh, every month was an MMWR. MMWR stands for Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. So they, she got this thing every week. <clears throat> and they had to report to the CDC every week all of the all of these information all this information about the measles, the mumps, the chicken pox, smallpox, of course, which they never had, syphilis, gonorrhea, uh, the flu, had they identified it. And of course, right now they would have to figure out whether anybody had coronavirus. Coronavirus isn't the most deadly virus out there. The hantavirus. This is Montana. So there's a lot of um, uh, can not kangaroo rats, what are they? Deer rats, yes. deer cat, deer mice. Lots of deer mice up there, just like there are down here. Uh, so morbidity is the number of cases of a specific illness, injury, or disability in a given group of people at a given time. That's your morbidity. Mortality has to do with death. And I've told you about uh, the, the fact that in Blaine County, where Chinook is, and that's also where the largest portion of uh, the Fort Belknap Reservation is. Blaine County is about the size of Delaware. But in Blaine County, the uh, mortality rate for white people was, uh, life expectancy was 80 for white people. And for natives, it was only 60. So they had to determine what the hell's going on. Are we killing off, all, how are, why are we killing off all these Indians? What's going on here? Why are the white people living and the, white, and, the, and the native people dying? Is it murder? Is that what's going on? Is that why people aren't living so long? As it turned out, the oldest person that had ever lived in that county was a lady that died at 113, and she was native. So wait a minute. If she can live to 113, my, my good friend uh, John R. Is, is 85 right now. Yet the life expectancy for an American Indian in Blaine County is only 60. So what's going on? Where, why are all these natives dying and why are the white people not dying? Well, the answer is alcohol. <clears throat> A lot of kids were drinking alcohol and then they were driving and then they were wrecking and killing themselves and anybody else that was in the car. It's very common up there. But it wasn't the white kids that were dying. It was the native kids that were dying. So why weren't the white kids dying just like the native kids were dying? And then they determined that their, the, uh, the way that they drank was different. Native kids were binge drinking, and the white kids were drinking every day. And that was the difference. So it, was, it had to do with binge drinking. So that's why, they were, that's, well, that's why their life expectancy was so low. Uh, mortality, of course, has to do with death. Et etiology is the causes or the origins, origins of a specific disease. And, of course, we had to figure out why life expectancy was so low among American Indians in that area. Especially when there were a lot older American Indians on the reservation than there were white people out there. But they just weren't dying in automobile accidents like the native kids were. <clears throat> and they were kids. As they got older, a lot of, a lot of the individuals that uh, I dealt with up there were recover, recovered or recovering alcoholics. When they were kids, they, they drank and they, got, they, and they became alcoholics. But as they got older and they got smarter, they stopped drinking. And so they were recovering alcoholics. And for that reason, they, uh, they, they uh, tended to live longer because they gave it up. The white people weren't really giving it up. They were drinking all their lives. <clears throat> and then they were dying in their 70s and 80s. Uh, incidence is the number of new cases of a disease uh, or condition that occur in a specific population within a defined time interval. That's the incidence rate. 
Uh, what do we have here in the United States with the coronavirus? The incidence rate is five right now. So we'll see what happens with those five people. The prevalence is the total number of diagnosed cases of a disease uh, or condition that exists at a given time. This is, we're hearing this from China. They have 2,700 cases. And of those 2,700 cases, 84 have died. Now, we can figure, we can look at the percentage between 84 and 2,700, and we can determine that about 4% of the, of the people that come down with coronavirus will die. Now, who has died of those 84 people? Were they kids? Were they old farts? Were they uh, teenagers? Were they people in their 30s or 40s? And the answer is it's all across the spectrum. Uh, kids don't seem to be getting the coronavirus, though, which is a good thing. Hate to see the kids die. So the prevalence rate is 2,700. Uh, the incidence rate, of course, we have five in the United States. So this is something that we have to keep an eye on in order to determine what's going on. Uh, the first ep epidemiology uh, study was in 1830, 1848, and 1854. Remember, we've got rich people that don't want to spend any money. They're cheap bastards. And you can bastard, B-A-S-T-A-R-D-S. They're bastards. And that's the reason why when, we just, when, that, when Goldberger figured out what was going on with Pellegra, nobody did anything about it. Because then the government of Alabama would have had to have fed all of the poor people. And they didn't want to feed all those black people or all those poor white trash. They didn't want to do that. So nobody would admit that Pellegra came from, from uh, poor nutrition. They didn't want to do that. Or they didn't want to put vitamins in their bread or in their flour because that's too expensive, costs too much money. They, didn't, they wanted more profits. Profits, money is more important than people are, as it turns out. Like we didn't know that already. Uh, so they had a cholera epidemic. Remember, cholera is one of the fecal-borne diseases. In other words, somebody takes a dump in the wrong place, and now all of a sudden it gets into the water supply. Now we have all this really negative bacteria out there. And this is one of the reasons why, when there's a flood, uh, they tell people not to drink the water because it gets into the water supply. The sewage gets into the water supply, and somebody might be sick, and so we might have an outbreak of cholera or dysentery, or E. coli. Uh, John Snow was a physician who was trying to determine why cholera outbreaks occurred and why they spread in such constant patterns. Uh, Snow was able to map the progress of the outbreak and noticed that the disease seemed to be isolated to individual families and might be different from one side of the street to the other side of the street. He determined that it was waterborne and traced it back to a contaminated water pump in Soho. And this is what it looked like. It started out looking like this, then it looked like that, then as you can see it just kept spreading. And so they had a cholera epidemic. What happened? Uh, fecal material got into the water supply and now we had a problem. Anytime we have a flood, people have to start drinking water. And this is one of the reasons why we had all that water that we shipped to, to Puerto Rico and why there was such a huge scandal when they found all these pallets of water out in the middle of the, of the jungle. Somebody had put them all there so that he, they could sell them. Remember, money is more important than people are. Write that down. People, money, money is the most important thing in the whole wide world. Only to rich people. <clears throat> That's why I'm here. I'm here for the cash. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many, how many thousands of dollars they pay me to stand here and tell jokes or whatever I do. Well, a full 25% of people in the United States have hypertension. 42.5% of the people uh, of African ancestry suffer from the problem, which leads to heart disease, stroke, and of course kidney disease. Blows out your kidneys and then you have to go on dialysis. 20% of the deaths in the black community can be attributed to hypertension, while the same problem in the white community only accounts for 10% of the deaths. What the hell's going on? What's the difference between white people and black people besides their skin or their hair, uh, their skin tone? I mean, what, what other differences are there? We all started out as 
people in Africa anyway, didn't we? Then we kind of just spread all over the place. People got pale because they went up where there wasn't any sun, so they didn't need the extra melanin. That's why they turned pale. No, that's not what happened. I was wondering what happened. Anyway, so why does he get to have such a nice tan? How come I look like somebody that just died? That's not fair. Look how blue I am. That's not right. Epidemiologists have sought to discover why the problem is so prevalent in the black community. Evolutionary psychology has tapped mate selection as a possible culprit. They're selecting people who are, ex who are more excitable, therefore they have higher blood pressure. It was purported that traveling in slave ships uh, may have selected individuals who retained salt. Those that lost salt readily would not have survived the journey. Sometimes it took four or five weeks to get over here, Africa to the United States or to wherever they dumped off their slaves. This is how they packed them in. Didn't get, really give them a lot of water, didn't give them any food hardly at all. And a lot of times they, when the bodies died, they would just dump them over the side. They'd say that the slave ships, the sharks knew which were the slave ships and they would follow the slave ships because every morning they would get up and throw the dead bodies over the side and then they'd have a free meal. Got to feed the sharks. As sad and stupid as that is. So the idea was the only individuals that made it over here were the individuals who retained salt, the individuals who were susceptible to high blood pressure. If you go to Africa, they don't have the same level. If you go to Nigeria, you go to the, the Gold Coast, what used to be the Slave Coast, this is where all the slaves came from. They don't have the same blood, high blood pressure that, that we have in the United States. And the reason is because well, there was a difference between what was going on and what was going on. Looking at individuals of African ancestry along the slave route in Nigeria, Jamaica, and the United States, the researchers discovered that only 7% of the people in rural Nigeria had hypertension, while those in Jamaica suffered at a rate of 26%, and those in Chicago suffered hypertension at a rate of 33%. Now remember, what did we have before? We had 10% of, of whites are suffering from high blood pressure. However, if we look at the differences, we see that high blood pressure is prevalent where the slaves came over, in Jamaica, which was uh, sugar plantations, and in Chicago. Of course, that's Michelle Obama, who is from Chicago. 33%. Uh, so we can see that uh, uh, Africans, when they had to travel, when they were brought over in the slave ships, they were more likely to have high blood pressure. Which is kind of interesting, because we have Michelle Obama, whose uh, ancestry goes back you know, a couple hundred years to the, the slave days. And then we have uh, Barack Obama, whose father was act actually Kenyan, and his mother was white. So his prevalence, his, he, she is more likely to have high blood pressure than he is, despite the fact that she's female and he's a male. Males have high blood pressure more readily than females do. Despite that fact, because his father was actually African, then uh, he has a less, uh, he is less likely to have high blood pressure than his wife is. Risk, risk factors began to show themselves as the researchers got farther away from Nigeria. Uh, uh, <clears throat> BMI rose steadily from Nigeria to Chicago. In other words, they, uh, they became larger and larger and larger. Uh, lack of exercise and poor diet explain nearly 50% of the hypertension. Uh, the slave ship salt theory does not explain all the differences between groups in Nigeria, Jamaica, and Chicago. Uh, there's, these are three levels of pictures. All of the people in the middle are from the United States. These people are from Jamaica. That's not right. These people are from, well, some of these people are from Jamaica and the other people are from the United States. He's from Jamaica, he's from Jamaica. He's from Jamaica, his, his ancestry is. Uh, I, don't I don't remember. I put the picture together, but I don't remember who's who. Incidence of uh, 235 P gene and hypertension among different ethnic groups. As you can see, uh, 235 T allele 
uh, Nigerians, a uh, percent of the population have, have this gene. African Americans, Jamaicans, European Americans have the, don't have the 235T allele. But as you can see, all the, uh, all the people of African ancestry have a fairly high percentage of the, uh, of the hypertension allele. A retrospective study is a backward-looking study in which a group of people who have a certain condition are compared with a group of people who are free of that condition. Retrospective studies are usually done by reviewing records. Retrospective studies were uh, important in determining the risk factors that led to the AIDS epidemic. Where did the AIDS epidemic come from? Why in the world did it strike the, Af the uh, African American? The um, uh, gay population uh, started in New York before it went across the country to San Francisco. Wherever we had large populations of, uh, of uh, gay, gay males, uh, we had uh, outbreaks of, of AIDS uh, in those populations. So where did it come from initially? Where did the coronavirus come from? We're trying to figure that one out. Uh, they looked at uh, those cats. And Harley, Harley looked up those cats. What were those cats? Not meerkats. Meerkats are down in Africa. I can't remember. Anyway, I know they were cute, weren't they? Anyway, we're trying to figure out where the hell the AIDS epidemic started. Uh, they traced it back. They traced it from uh, New York uh, down to Haiti. And from Haiti, they traced it over to Uganda. And in Uganda, they, they uh, traced it to the first individual that came down with AIDS. Uh, he was an individual that lived in a, 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 uh, a jungle area that had monkeys in it. And potentially he ate monkeys. Ate monkey meat, because in Africa they eat what they refer to as bush meat. And bush meat can be anything. It can be rodents, it can be monkeys, it can be anything. They'll eat. They, they think it gives them virility, makes them more virile, as weird as that is. I don't, I don't know how weird that is. Everybody has their own conditions. Anyway, researchers uh, first saw a marked increase in the number of, of rare forms of cancer called Carposi sarcoma. I lived through this because I was working in medicine at the time. The first, the first time we saw AIDS was uh, we saw uh, Carpo, uh, Carposi sarcoma, uh, and, and we had never seen this before. The only individuals that came down with, with Carposi sarcoma were individuals who were immunocompromised. It was bubble boys. That's the only people that came down with Carposi sarcoma. Uh, the other thing was pneumocystis pneumonia. Very, very uncommon. Uh, only people that are, are, are immunocompromised. People who we kill off all of their, uh, we kill off all of their uh, bone marrow. These are the individuals that come down with pneumocystis pneumonia. And all of a sudden, we're seeing it in a, a relatively healthy population. And it freaked everybody out because you know, we saw all of a sudden, it's just like uh, the coronavirus. We saw people dying of this and we had no clue where, where it came from. Same way with the Ebola virus. Ebola virus is really, really ugly. This is nasty stuff. People do survive Ebola virus, but they, they bleed. They bleed from everywhere. Their ears bleed, their eyes bleed, their nose bleeds. They just start gushing blood. They hemorrhage. That's the Ebola virus. And then they die. And every drop of blood is contagious. That's the Ebola virus. And it scared us to death. We'd never seen anything like this before. Bubonic plague. Bubonic plague, they had no clue where it came from. What happened was the it gets into your lymph nodes. It's this bacteria that gets into your lymph nodes, and it, make, and it makes your lymph nodes explode. And when they do that, it forms bruises. So you've got all these black spots all over your body, in your armpits, especially in your groin, uh, in your neck, because you've got your tonsils, and your lymph nodes would explode, and then it would turn black. It's, as attractive as that sounds. So we've got all these really strange diseases and we didn't know where they came from and we had to figure it out. People were dying of the Black Death and we, you know, duh, I don't know. 
The same thing happened with AIDS. It scared us to death. And we didn't, not only did we not know what it was, we didn't know how to stop it. I was lucky at the time. I was, I was working in Omaha, Nebraska. Well, Omaha, Nebraska is not the gay capital of anything. It's <laughs> hardly any, any individuals. The epidemiologists were able to determine that the disease was being spread through sharing needles among intravenous drug users and unprotected anal sex among gay males. Uh, it had to do with blood, and we didn't really understand what was going on. So wherever there was, if somebody had an open sore, and one guy had AIDS and the other individual had an open sore, now we have two people with AIDS. If there was any ripping and tearing that was taking place, any blood was produced from the intercourse, now we've got a problem. That's how, and that's one of the reasons why they tried to get these guys to start using condoms, because then, of course, they weren't spreading their, uh, their blood to anybody else. Perspective study uh, is a forward-looking longitudinal study that follows a healthy group of subjects over time and projects how variables will change. An example of a perspective test was one conducted in San Francisco looking at breast cancer rates and drinking alcohol. Now, drinking alcohol is one of those subjects that a lot of people don't want you to talk about because they want to drink their martinis. Their martinis. They want you to, they want to drink, so they don't want anybody to tell them how bad it is. Uh, so this was a really controversial study that they did, but they looked at all these women. Uh, over 70,000 women uh, were in the study, and it showed that over a 20-year period, women who drank only one drink a day increased their likelihood of developing breast cancer by only 1.08%. That's not bad at all. <clears throat> women who drank two drinks a day increased their likelihood of developing developing cancer by 1.21. And women who drank three drinks a day increased their likelihood by developing, uh, developing cancer by 1.38. So the more you drink, the more, more, it's, the more likely you are to have uh, breast cancer. In a natural experiment, an experimenter tries to study an independent variable under natural causes, conditions. A researcher has a group of women uh, keep diaries one group frequents bars and binge drinks, so while the other group frequents uh, the same bar but doesn't consume alcohol. Uh, they are looking to see which group is sexually assaulted more frequently, uh, as you can guess, which, which group gets uh, uh, attacked more frequently. It's the drinkers. For some reason, uh, alcohol, drunk women make men mad. I have no idea why, but men are more likely to attack them. Uh, they did a study looking at alcohol and marijuana, and what they discovered was that uh, in uh, uh, consensual couples, uh, if the woman drinks alcohol and smokes pot, she's more likely to be sexually assaulted. Domestic violence. Intimate partner violence. What, what does one thing have to do with the other? Well, we already, we already have done these studies where we looked at alcohol, and what we discovered was men are more likely to attack women who are drunk. Maybe they seem more vulnerable. Uh, maybe they're, they act more uh, accepting of, uh, of uh, sexual relations. I don't know. But that's what we have discovered. And now we, we have looked at uh, mar mixing marijuana in with the alcohol. And what we've discovered is that they're more likely to attack them. Randomized clinical trials, uh, and, and this is really important because we try to figure out why people are victimized over and over and over again. And a lot of times it has to do with their coping techniques. If, they're coping, if they were uh, sexually molested at a certain time in their life, their coping technique may be to drink and for, to try to forget. And if that's the way, it, if that's what they do, then they're more likely to actually be sexually assaulted again. And this is the reason why if somebody has been raped, they're more likely to be raped a second time, as bizarre as that is. And we need to think about these things, and we need to understand them. A lot of times it has to do with coping. Randomized clinical trials test one or more independent variables on groups of individuals. The most common randomized clinical trials establishes a baseline with a group and then measures the level of change at different levels of the independent variable. This is uh, the within subjects design. 
So we're using the subjects as the room controls. Between groups, uh, design measures differences between multiple groups. In community field trials, the groups are entire communities that are measured against one another. Crest toothpaste trials in the 1950s, the reason I'm, I put that up there is because in the 1950s they decided that they were going to see if the fluoride in Crest uh, actually kept people from getting cavities. So they decided that they would use the rural uh, area of Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. Uh, and luckily I was given free toothpaste for, I don't know, the first five years of my school career. And I was part of the Crest trials in the 1950s. Now sadly, and this breaks my heart every time I think about it, but sadly, we were given the placebo. We, there wasn't any fluoride in our Crest toothpaste. And it still tasted like crap. To this day, I cannot stand the taste of Crest toothpaste. Because I was in those trials, and I had to use it every time I brushed my teeth. And it tastes really bad. I think it tastes really bad. Just seeing the green color of Crest toothpaste makes me want to vomit, OK? <laughs> But we were in those press trials, and unfortunately, I was not given, I was not given the uh, the good stuff. I was given, I was given the uh, stuff without fluoride. So I've got crappy teeth. It pisses me off every time I think about it, and I don't know who to blame. My mother, I'm thinking. Meta-analysis uh, is a quantitative technique that combines the results of many research studies examining the same uh, effect or phenomenon. Uh, it is a statistical compilation of similar studies and acts as a, su a summary <laughs> of results to look for similar outcomes and general realities. The researcher is looking for a factor or a trend that holds uh, up through all of the studies. Meta-analysis was performed on 113 students looking at uh, over 100,000 women and found that there may be a causal link between drinking and breast cancer. <sighs> Remember, they had 70,000. But the only ones that they could actually use were the ones that actually developed breast cancer. And the ones who drank more than others. That's the way it works. I wonder which kind of alcohol that does that. Is it just beer or whiskey? Or it's alcohol. It's alcohol, both of them? Yeah, what, the, what you do is, when you do one of these studies, is that you say, uh, how much do you drink? And if they say beer, then you figure out how, the percentage of alcohol in a beer. And then if they drink vodka, you know, if they drink Everclear, my God, who drinks Everclear? Uh, but if it's Everclear, they figure out how much alcohol is in the drink. So when they say drink, they're talking about one beer, one glass of wine, or a certain amount of, of uh, uh, hard alcohol. In order for a causal uh, link between disease process and factor to be made, certain criteria must be met. The evidence must be consistent with a meta-analysis. The alleged cause must have been in place before the disease appeared. The cause and effect relationship must uh, make sense. Uh, there must be a dose-response relationship between the risk factor and the disease process, as with smoking and cancer. Uh, we had recognized the uh, connection between uh, smoking and cancer. Back during the Revolutionary War, there was a, uh, a member of the uh, Congressional Congress who said we needed to outlaw tobacco. Well, that went over real well uh, with the Southern people because, you know, they were the ones growing the tobacco. And, of course, they were all pissed off about this. So we've been fight we fought about this for over 200 years before the tobacco people finally admitted, oh, wait a minute, maybe there's a connection. We had all of this, all of these statistics, we had all of these studies that showed that tobacco had a direct connection to lung cancer or, and other cancers. But they wouldn't admit it because, you know, money is more important. Money is more important than people are. Greed is the most important thing in the whole wide world. The strength of the association between the alleged cause and the health outcome uh, the relative risk must suggest causality. The incidence of prevalence of the health outcome must drop when the alleged causal factor is removed, as with the decline of cholera after the contaminated, contaminated well was closed in London in 1854. So we knew that that was the cause because as soon as we closed that, uh, 
that well, we stop getting new cases. Pellegra, we were able to cure it with, with uh, vitamin B3, with niacin, which tastes like crap. It's real bitter. Well, most of the vitamins are fairly bitter. But we couldn't get them to admit it. They didn't want to admit it because it cost them too much money. <clears throat> and that's, of course, what we're trying to do with the coronavirus. We have to figure out where the coronavirus comes from so that we can stop it. It is 420. We do stop it at 420. 3 o'clock is 420. Okay. Anyway, that's the way it works.